Hello there, my name is Declan Costello. I am an ear, nose and throat surgeon and I specialise in voice disorders. I'm uh, going to talk to you for the next little while about the voice, about its anatomy, about how it works, about how I, as a laryngologist, examine vocal cords, and I'm going to talk to you a little bit later on about COVID, uh, very topical and on everyone's lips at the moment, and the potential risks of COVID with regards to singing, speaking and shouting. I'm going to start though by introducing you to this character who is Saint Blaise. Saint Blaise is the patron saint of throats as you may know. Saint Blaise, saint Blaise became the patron saint of throats when he uh, saved the life of a boy by fishing a, a fish bone out of his throat um, and uh, ever since then we've, we've used St Blaise as our sort of touchstone. So if ever you have a problem with your throat, if you have a sore throat or you're worried that you might not be able to sing, uh, then say a few words to St Blaise. So as we go through I'm going to talk to you a bit about laryngologists. Now laryngologists are specialist ear, nose and throat surgeons and we have a particular interest in the voice and if you uh, ever have a problem with your voice you may find yourself needing to be seen by uh, an ear, nose and throat surgeon by a laryngologist and we have specific voice clinics that are set up to deal with performers, actors, singers and so on. And many laryngologists have a particular interest and a particular uh, background and good insight into how performers can uh, run into problems with their voices. I myself studied music before I studied medicine and then I did my five years of medicine after that and specialist training within ear, nose and throat surgery and then I decided to become a specialist laryngologist. So I have a particular interest uh, and background in singing and I continue to do quite a lot of singing myself. Well, as laryngologists, we need to be able to look at the vocal cords. So this is how it would have been done back in 1841. Manuel Garcia is probably the first laryngologist and uh, he is credited with inventing the laryngoscope. Now, poor old Manuel here is uh, examining his own larynx and he's essentially got a mirror on a stick and he's put the mirror on the stick in the back of his throat. It's at 45 degrees, so he's looking down at the back of his throat. Uh, the oil lamp in front of him is reflecting light onto the mirror on his head. The mirror on his head is reflecting light into the mirror in his hand. The mirror in his hand is reflecting light into the back of his throat. And using the mirror in his hand, he's also uh, able to look at his vocal cords. Now, quite how much he actually saw with this very dim oil lamp and multiple mirrors and trying to get a look around corners, how much he actually saw, I'm really, uh, I really don't know, but he's credited with the first laryngoscope. This is Manuel Garcia examining somebody else's throat, um, uh, possibly got a slightly better view. Things have moved on and uh, we have much better techniques. If you were to look in your own throat with a mirror, you'd get roughly a view like this. This is me trying to examine my own larynx for a Radio 3 programme a few years ago. It's not the easiest thing. You can see I've got my shaving mirror in front of me. I've got a mirror on a stick. It's basically a dental mirror, a mirror in the, on a stick in the back of my throat. And um, I'm pulling my tongue out to get the tongue out of the way. Uh, and I'm, I'm kind of going, ooh, as I'm, I'm looking in the back of my throat. And I can just about see my own vocal cords, but I'm really not seeing very much particularly clearly. Fast forward to the 21st century, and this is where we're at at the moment. Now, this is my colleague Nigel examining my vocal cords. Now, the technology has moved on to the point where we can mount miniature cameras on the end of flexible endoscopes. So Nigel is passing the endoscope through my nose, and when he gets to the back of my nose, he's going to turn it downwards, and he's going to go over the back of my nose, uh, as he is at the moment, and he's going to look vertically downwards towards my vocal cords, and there they are off in the distance, uh, the vocal cords, and when I'm breathing, Breathing, the vocal cords are apart and when I say E they come together and with these flexible endoscopes it's possible to speak, shout, sing, whistle, whisper, do whatever you want to do so you get a really lovely idea of the function, you get very clear images. So that's one way of looking at the vocal cords. Another way of doing it is to use a rigid endoscope that sits on the tongue. You pull the tongue out and, and the endoscope has got an, a camera angled downwards and you get very, very clear images again. But obviously when you've got a rigid endoscope in your mouth and somebody pulling on your tongue, the only noise you can make is uh, um, you, you don't really have the option to shout or speak or, or do whatever you want to do. So actually f uh, in terms of looking at the function and how the, all the muscles are interacting with each other, the, uh, the use of the flexible endoscope, the chip tip flexible endoscope, I think is, uh, is very useful.
Now I've written at the top there that stroboscopy is mand mandatory. Now I'm going to come back to stroboscopy in just a minute, but stroboscopy is a technique for looking at the vocal cords moving in slow motion. As I say, I'll come back to that in just a moment. So let's think about the voice as a musical instrument. A musical instrument really requires three fundamental components. It requires an energy source, and if you think about the violin, the, vi the, the, the energy source in a violin is the bow. It's that that drives the whole system into movement. It needs something that's going to vibrate, and in a violin that's the, uh, that's the um, string itself that vibrates, vibrates and produces the sound. And then you need something that's going to resonate, uh, and in a violin that's the body. So move that forward to the, uh, to the voice. So the energy system for the voice, the thing that makes the whole thing move, is the lungs. The lungs drive air through the vocal cords, through the vocal folds, and cause them to vibrate. So the vocal folds themselves are the source of the sound. And as you look at this image, you'll see that the vocal folds are a sort of V-shape. The vocal folds are the two white strips that you see on the image. Um, and uh, when you're breathing, the vocal folds are apart. And when you say E, they come together. You'll see some videos of that in just a second. And on this photograph, the, the bottom of the photo is the front of the throat, and the top of the image is the back of the throat. Um, and they're fixed at the front. And when you say E, they come together to produce sound. And then the third thing you have in this scenario is the resonating chamber. So in the, uh, in the case of the voice, the things that resonate and add interest and bloom to the sound are the shape of the back of the throat itself, so that's the pharynx, uh, but also things like chest to a certain extent, the shape of the inside of the mouth, the shape of the oral cavity, nose and sinuses play a little bit of a part, but not so much. It's predominantly that the resonance is predominantly provided by the shape of the pharynx, the back of the throat. And this is just another way of looking at the same thing. So again, we've got that photograph uh, 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 taken from vertically above, looking at the vocal folds, uh, the left vocal fold and the right vocal fold. And uh, uh, another way of looking at this with a, with a slice in this direction, this is called a coronal cut, where you look through the vocal folds in this direction. Um, and you see essentially on these images that the, the vocal folds are basically infoldings of an airway. The airway is a tube and the vocal folds are just infoldings of that airway. Hence they're called vocal folds and not vocal cords. Vocal cords implies that they're sort of like rubber bands hanging around in space. They're not actually, they're just infoldings of the airway and they can come together to close off the airway and they move apart to allow you to breathe. Thinking about pitch for a second, um, if you ting an A440 tuning fork, the tines of the tuning fork are vibrating 440 times per second. They're moving back and forth 440 times a second, and that's the A above middle C. And the same thing is true of the voice. So if I, I'm a tenor, if I'm singing a tenor top A, that is uh, 440 hertz, 440 vibrations of the vocal folds per second. So they move apart and together 440 times a second. And if you go up an octave, then the, uh, the, uh, you double the pitch, uh, you double the frequency, I should say. So you go up to a soprano top A and you've got 880 hertz. Now, uh, and then, you know, the Allegri Miserere top C is 1,024, the Queen of the Night top F is way up into the thousands. And you might ask, how is it possible for the vocal cords to move that quickly? Um, it's not that there's a muscle that's shaking several hundred times a second, but what happens is that the vocal cords, which when you're breathing are apart, they actually come together when you start to produce sound. And then as the air comes from uh, the lungs, there's a puff of air that moves the vocal cords very slightly apart and then they snap shut again, and, the, uh, and that tiny puff of air that comes through, however many hundreds of times a second that is happening, however many hundreds of puffs in air per second is going through, that determines the pitch that you're uh, speaking or singing at. So 440 puffs of air per second correlates to 440 hertz, which means A440, tenor top A, or a sort of soprano low A. Um, it's worth remembering that not the whole vocal fold is moving, so you're not mo the whole thing isn't moving apart. And in fact, what's actually happening is that the surface lining of the vocal fold is gliding over the underlying tissues. Um, and you can see on this slow motion uh, view, uh, this is a, 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 a type of video called stroboscopy, where we're looking at the vocal cords moving in slow motion, and it gives us extremely useful information about the vibratory properties and the suppleness and the pliability 
of the vocal cords. And this is a very specific bit of technology that we find in voice clinics. And as a singer, if ever you uh, do need to have uh, your larynx examined, then it would be extremely important that you insist on stroboscopy to get that really very refined, detailed information about how the vocal cords are moving. And you can see from the video why it's called the mucosal wave. The mucosa is the lining of the vocal cord and it produces a thing a bit like a wave. It looks a bit like a belly dance. Voice disorders come in all shapes and sizes and there are um, basically four broad areas of ways in which the voice can go wrong. There are inflammatory problems, uh, neoplastic or structural means lumps and bumps, uh, muscle tension problems and neuromuscular. And uh, in different scenarios different things can go wrong. Uh, they can all be related to each other in slightly unhelpful ways. So one pro a problem in one area can lead to uh, di difficulties in another area. So if you've got a lump on one of the vocal cords, for example, that can lead to muscle tension problems. Equally, a muscle tension problem, an issue about how you're holding the muscles, can lead to lumps and bumps. And they can all be interconnected I in very complex ways. Probably the most common area of uh, anomaly or abnormality, if you like, in singers is uh, muscle tension problems. Uh, and then we do see, I do see in my clinics with singers, I do see a reasonable number of lumps and bumps uh, on the vocal cords and uh, often inflammatory things as well, perhaps related to overuse, perhaps related to reflux and, and other things too. So let's move on to the very topical subject of singing and COVID. Is singing safe? Now, at the very outset of the COVID pandemic, uh, back in February, March time, there were reports of clusters of COVID in, centered around choirs in the United States, in Europe and elsewhere, and there were deaths associated with that. Now, it wasn't clear at that time why exactly the COVID had spread so voraciously in those groups. Was it because of the singing? Was it because of poor ventilation? Was it because everybody was sharing drinks or hugging each other at the end of the rehearsal and so on? None of those things were very clear but as a consequence of those clusters of Covid public health authorities around the world decided to lock down singing. Uh, public health doctors work on the basis that if there is a cluster of disease you shut down the source, work out what the problem is and then you can perhaps open up afterwards and, and uh, singing having been identified as a possible source for the problem it was shut down very rapidly. Now on top of that wind and brass instruments were also singled out as potentially dangerous so wind and brass playing has been in the firing line as well and hence all of our instrumental colleagues have really struggled to get back to performing. I was in contact with a number of friends who are singers, choral directors and so on and it became quite clear quite quickly that we were going to need to do some research to look at actually the extent to which singing and wind and brass playing was dangerous. If we were going to persuade the government that they would be able to lift some of these very tight restrictions on singing we were going to need to do some research to uh, objectively demonstrate what the issues were and whether there were any genuine dangers here. So we decided to look at the amount of aerosol and the amount of droplet that is produced in these situations. Now just to explain, aerosol are the very tiny fine particles that come out of your mouth or come out of your instrument and they're so light that they just float in the air and those things, the aerosol won't go away until it's ventilated away by a breeze or by a bit of machinery. Droplets, on the other hand, are the slightly larger particles that come out of your mouth and fall onto the floor about a metre or two in front of you. So we, uh, in a very rapidly put together bit of research with the uh, team in Bristol, an aerosol team in Bristol and with some other colleagues, we put together some research looking at the amount of aerosol produced by singing, by speaking, by shouting, by wind instruments and a whole variety of different situations. And this is the paper that was published uh, on the 13th of August. Uh, it's been published in pre-print version which means that it hasn't yet been peer-reviewed. It needs to go to a scientific journal for them to evaluate it so there may be some changes that come through as a result. So here you see the aerosol team that did the research looking at this. We start with the Bristol aerosol team. Flo Gregson is the uh, principal author on this, the first author, but the lead of that team is Professor Jonathan Reed, uh, who is uh, an aerosol specialist uh, of national and international reputation, and Brian Bazadek was also on the team from Bristol. We have Natalie Watson, who's an ENT surgeon and also a singer colleague of mine, and her husband Chris Orton, 
uh, is a respiratory doctor uh, and a PhD doing his research at the Brompton Hospital. So we very rapidly got this team together to look at how much aerosol was produced by singers and by wind instrumentalists. And you see here what the experimental setup was. Essentially you've got a cone that is drawing air through it and as the person is speaking, shouting, singing, coughing, doing what they're doing, it's drawing all that air through and counting the number of particles and measuring the size of those particles as it's going in so that we can quantify is actually shouting any more dangerous than singing? Um, because if it isn't then we need to think about how the guidelines are framed. You see here also a, a horn being tested and a flute because various instruments have been, uh, have been suggested as being dangerous to use. So here's the conclusions. Again, preliminary findings because they haven't yet been peer-reviewed, but essentially what we see is that the louder you shout, the louder you sing, the louder you speak, the more aerosol you produce. And actually that is a huge effect from the very quietest speaking to the very loudest shouting. There is a 20 to 30 fold increase in the amount of aerosol you're producing. And that's true of speaking and of singing, 20 to 30 fold increase. Now the question is, is there more aerosol produced by singing or by shouting at equivalent volumes? And the answer is that they are uh, very roughly similar. There is actually more aerosol produced by singing than by speaking. But that difference between those two pales into insignificance compared with the huge difference between quiet singing and very loud singing. And you can see that on this graph here. You can see that we've got charts showing uh, speaking happy birthday at quiet, mid and high volumes and charts showing uh, singing uh, happy birthday at quiet, medium and high volumes and we measured these by the way with decibel meters so we were pretty sure, pretty accurate about the exact uh, volume at which people were speaking and singing. This has generated a massive amount of interest around the world. I mean really completely unexpected from our point of view. Uh, we've had reports uh, from all over the world, from New York to uh, Australia, uh, a lot of interest in the press in this country as well. Clearly there's a huge interest not only from uh, singers and, and instrumentalists but also uh, from uh, in, on the professional side but also on the amateur side as well. People are absolutely desperate to get back to their choirs. So how are we going to reduce the risk of COVID transmission amongst choirs? Well, singing quietly all the time is not really an option for in most scenarios. Now there are some forms of musical uh, singing production where actually you could afford to sing a bit quieter and have a microphone and amplify yourself. But actually if you're a choir where you're reliant on a range of dynamics from pianissimo up to fortissimo, amplification just isn't really an option. So you need to think about other mitigating factors that can reduce the potential for transmission of COVID. And that would include things like being in a bigger room, cathedral would be a great example for example, um, better ventilation. We know that ventilation is absolutely key. The quicker and more efficiently you can blow these aerosols out of the room and into the outside air, the better. Fewer singers, clearly the fewer singers you have, the less total aerosol there is in the environment anyway. And I've said already that you could reduce the volume by using some amplification if necessary. Thank you very much for your attention. I'd be more than happy to hear from you if you'd like to contact me. It's been a pleasure to speak to you and thank you for the opportunity.